How many of you have felt that the weather, the temperature these days are not how it used to be? Me too. My hometown is no longer a breezy and chilly place anymore. But how many of you have thought that this climate change induced discomfort can not only cause like larger disasters like natural disasters, but also the fact that our ability to produce our food being threatened. Climate change is decreasing 1% of our global food production every year. This looks like a small number, but remember, our population is growing at the rate of more than 1% every year. So this means that year by year and month by month, day by day, we're getting farther away from being able to feed everybody on this planet. And this would only get worse if we don't do any intervention. Why? Because sadly, one of the major contributors to climate change is the way we produce our food itself. How we produce our food is threatening our grandchildren's ability to produce theirs. And the fact is that, for example, especially in the animal protein side, is highly inefficient. Can you imagine that it is contributing to more than 50% of the global greenhouse gas emission and is the number one reason for global deforestation? If this does not change, not only increased food price, but only hunger, starvation, and even conflicts and wars between countries would be inevitable. Okay, well, let's speak about the solution. To speak about the potential solutions, it's important to acknowledge that our global food production is highly centralized and inefficient. For example, our key crops, soybeans, wheat, sugarcane, palm oil, these are being fed to factory farmings that would then lead to highly processing food production, then would lead to this distribution and transportation over long distance globally. Despite the fact that these very key crops can fulfill our nutritional needs and our sensorial needs. I'm speaking about that. We need great tasting food too, right? So the question is, could we ever be able to decentralize our global food production system and make it more efficient? Now, I would like to speak about one potential solution that I would initially would never thought about. And it turned out to be very fun. I never expected it to be. We're talking about tempeh. <laughs> okay, so who loves tempeh? I love tempeh. It's the coolest food. I'm biased, but it's the coolest food. I love tempeh. Tempeh's been my favorite food. It's a food that my mom fed me with when I was a baby as my weaning food. It was my favorite childhood snack, fried tempeh. And even until now, white rice, sambal, fried tempeh is my comfort food. So despite that it goes very closely with my daily life since I was a baby, the discovery started when I was obsessed with bodybuilding. I wanted to have the highest muscle mass and the lowest fat mass. I want to have six pack, right? So I tried different sources of protein, like eating meat, eggs, or bodybuilding milk every day, but either that left me financially broke or bloated, right? So as a food scientist, I tried to look for alternatives. I tried to look into this publication, this meticulous journal articles, and discovery ended in 2021. So with other experts and myself, we published this called Tempe Bible. We summarized, <laughs> thank you. So we summarized more than 50 years of Tempe publication into this one 51 page that's been submitted to the number one food science journal on earth. And <laughs> I got some mind blowing facts I would like to share with you today. One, on nutrition, if you compare it to beef, Tempe contain similar amounts of protein and energy, significantly higher amounts of fiber, calcium, and significantly lower in saturated fat and salt. Second, on sustainability, 
For the same amount of protein that we can produce compared to beef, tempeh uses four times less energy. So it's four times less, four times more energy efficient, and it's 20 times more emission efficient. And third, but not least, on affordability. We Indonesians know how cheap tempeh could be, right? It could be eight times cheaper than beef for the same amount of protein. Okay, so it's nutritious, it's sustainable, and it's affordable. But tempeh is just a food. How can it create this global change? You might think. I did think that too. But tempeh is not just a food. Tempeh is actually a process, a fermentation process that we can play around with the ingredients change it into a fast kinds of ingredients to create something that is as nutritious, sustainable, and affordable. Today, I would like to share with you how you can make your own tempeh. So my mom taught me how to make tempeh before I left for my PhD in the US. And since then, I've been playing around with tempeh and I can assure you, it is very fun. Now, this is how you can make tempeh. You only need three ingredients. Your favorite beans, tempest salt culture, and water. So first, you want to soak your beans because the whole process, the point is you want to make the baby tempeh mushrooms happy. Okay, so it's technically a mold of fungi, but let's call it tempeh mushroom. You want to make our baby tempeh mushrooms in our salt culture happy. They want tender foods. That's why we soak the beans first. Then after that, oh, by the way, you can play around with different ingredients. I mix, for example, I mix soybeans with mung beans. Then we want to remove the skin because they don't like skin. And we want to boil them. They would like it cooked and tender once again. Then we want to dry them. The tempeh baby mushrooms don't like too hot foods. Then it's time to meet them with their foods. So this starter culture is filled with these minuscule tempeh baby mushrooms. We want to meet them with their foods then you can do this hand washing like gesture to mix your beans with your starter culture well then the babies would need their bedrooms the bedrooms could be folded leaves it could be trays it could be plastic bags but i personally like a zero plastic way so for example we use teak leaves very traditional leaves already have their windows baby mushrooms need windows in their bedrooms but with plastic bags you need to poke holes in it and after that wrap it and leave it for one to two days at Indonesian room temperature. It's perfect for temperature fermentation. It's between 28 to 32 degrees Celsius, right? Leave it like that, then voila, you got this fluffy, then sliceable meat alternative. But I believe tempeh is not meat replacer. Tempeh is a tasty, high quality protein in its own right. Now you notice that there were more than, there were two ingredients I included, but there are actually more than 20 ingredients that you can make into tempeh. Your favorite beans, I'm sure they can be made into tempeh. With this information, I would like to invite you all to imagine. Imagine that we can give people the power to produce their affordable, sustainable, and nutritious food. Imagine that instead of being fed to animals and farms, these can be made into delicious foods that can nourish our body, but creating better environmental impact. Imagine that how we produce our food is transparent, is something you can see and you can touch. And imagine associating how we produce our food with a feeling of togetherness, joy and happiness, just like how I feel every time I make timber with my mom. And imagine, with all this fun, we're decentralizing global food production gradually. Okay, now, what should we do next? In order to create global impact, this has to be a movement. But how could you join the movement? I got three easy steps that you can follow. Number one, get to love tempeh. If you haven't tried tempeh, try tempeh. If you've got bad first impression of tempeh, 
give it a second chance. Give it a third chance, the fourth chance. There are many amazing tempeh products out there. And eating tempeh is far from boring. Yes, it is typically stir fried in Indonesia on top of white rice, but it can be also in sushi, in pasta, in shawarmas, in BLT, in avocado toast, in Wellington, in tacos. It's limitless. Secondly, cook your own tempeh. It's a fun process. You can start with the easiest, the fried tempeh with sambal. You can't go wrong with that. Then play with seasoning, with marinade, play with different flavors. Then play with different forms of texture, like tempeh burger, why not? Then you can go wild, making tempeh desserts, ice cream, protein bars, why not? And the third one, make your own tempeh. Making tempeh is a completely different realm. It's a completely different realm, it's an art, it's a craft by itself. So you can start with the easiest soybeans. Yeah, that's the easiest. Then you can play around with different wrapping materials. Try traditional ones like teak leaves, guava leaves, waru leaves. You can use your favorite container. Play around with it. Then you can incorporate your favorite beans. If you like chickpeas, if you like mung beans, if you like navy beans, black beans, incorporate them with your soybeans to make it easier. Then if you level up, make its own dedicated tempeh. Then finally, Go wild, ferment instant noodles if you're keen, or pasta, or incorporate edible flowers. Make it an art, choose your favorite colors, make it joyful. It's fun, isn't it? But remember, on top of all this fun, with every tempeh you eat, with every tempeh you cook, and with every tempeh you make, remember that we are gradu we're gradually decentralizing global whole food production, one tempeh at the time. But wait, I believe tempeh is not the only forgotten and hidden treasure of food technology that can give people the power to produce, again, nutritious, sustainable and affordable foods. There are other hidden traditional knowledge like tempeh around the world. So I'm inviting every single one of you who attend this talk live or virtually, to look into what your grandparents know, but nobody else seems to know. What the science world does not know yet, because perhaps this hidden heritage is the key to again enable us to produce nutritious, sustainable, and affordable food, because this is the kind of future food that we and our planet deserve. Thank you. Thank you.